appreciate you streaming in here on Birds 365, 50 some odd hours, the Eagles Cowboys. I'm going to talk about that game and several other things with our next guest from NFL.com, Eric Edholm, good enough to jump aboard with me, Jody Mack and uh, Barrett Brooks. E.E., here's where I want to start with you. I'm just uh, reading Dak Prescott quotes leading up to this game, and he said, this is a statement about ourselves. We have to make a statement about ourselves coming into the game. They played some very good games, some very big. Is he being dismissive? Didn't he learn anything from Micah Parsons last week talking about Jalen Hurts? Is it about the team or is it about – he's not giving the Eagles any credit. He's, it's all about the Cowboys, this Eagles-Cowboys uh, matchup on Sunday. You buying what uh, Dak Prescott is saying about his team? Well, first of all, good morning, you guys. Uh, good to be on with you, Barry. <laughs> morning, Stay morning. In the house. That's oh, right. okay for the career. Okay, okay. I'm a Mizzou guy, so I'll, we'll, we'll. Oh, we'll, you went we'll, to Mizzou. I will, I'm, I'm mad you didn't, but that's all right. We'll we'll, tell, we'll save that one for later. But uh, <laughs> well, you know they they need recruit me, man. What's was crazy? No. Man. How did you not recruit oh. me? You know, God, the <laughs> early '90s Mizzou stories give me PTSD. We'll put right. those aside, man. I, I let's let's focus on the present, the 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 quality Eagles. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, I don't know that it's that dismissive, but look, this is obviously a, a, a bloodthirsty rivalry here, and and I think the the Cowboys on the, it's funny because they know their fate in the sense that you know catching the Eagles this isn't going to happen, but at the same time they also smell a little blood in the water, I think, and they're going to take their opportunity to you know, to, to, to make sure that they're in the moment and that they're going to be the ones sort of asserting themselves, at least in their minds or whatever. I don't, you know, I don't know what, how it's going to play out, but it is, it is always fun when, uh, you know, you hear the guys talk and you kind of read between the lines and try to figure out exactly what they're saying. But, you know, for Dak, it's always been like uh, this season anyway, like two steps forward, one back. I mean, you know, he's, he's been really good, but, you know, the injury obviously kind of threw off his season a little bit. And right when you start to think this offense might – Dallas offense might be turning the corner, uh, you know, they, they have some moments. They can't put a couple teams away this year where you say to yourself, are they missing that kind of killer instinct a little bit? So maybe they're kind of putting a little self-applied pressure there too. Well, I, at the end of the day, you know, the, the they're trying to still make it like there's no rivalry between the Eagles and, and – Dallas, you know, which is BS, you know, I, I, I've lived in that world. Sure. Uh, for, you know, I just got drafted to my world. But looking at them, player for player, I just think that this Eagles team is just a far superior team. And I think they understand it. So I think that's a little bit of a squawking by them, just knowing that, uh, you know, they got to come and put their big boy pants against this against this Eagles team. They yeah, know I would, that they're a team. I would love to see like what would have happened had Dallas been in the NFC South this year, just for you know to see like would they <laughs> would their record be you know I mean would they be killing everybody? But you're right. I mean, so far this season, Philly's been the better team. I still think Dallas is dangerous. You know, they have a they have a turnover creating defense. They do have playmakers on offense. Dak can get hot. There you know there's some factors that I think make them a good football team. But I just don't know that it's been to the consistent level to what Philly has shown this year and. You know, if they can't win this one, you know, given that that Hertz is banged up and and you know that the circumstances around what they need, the, then then I think we really start kind of questioning their credentials for you know, just beyond making the playoffs. Eric, two part question. Part one: Do you have a uh, MVP vote this year? I don't. No, I just uh, you know I go around telling women at bars I do, but I don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. Good job, and we're sorry if we're ready. I'm married. I'm married. Like, my wife is there, there are 400 people watching this right now. Hopefully, they can keep it between us. Um, then if you don't good, this is a good, uh, question you go ahead and answer and not worry about revealing anything. If you had a vote and you were of the belief that it's a fluid situation on a week-in, week-out basis, how you play, comparing players to other players to decide who should be on top and get your vote, at this stage right now, before, if I had asked you this question Sunday at 4 o'clock as the Eagle game just wrapped up, Jalen Hurts had the game he had, a couple interceptions, but threw for over 300 yards. Uh, A.J. Brown, new all-time re receiving record, ran for three more. What else is new? Him running for touchdowns. If you had Jalen Hurts as your MVP as of Sunday, does it change because he got hurt? 
He's probably going to miss this game if they win. He's probably going to sit the last two games. We'll not know how injured he is or isn't because the Eagles won't tell us. Right. How does his not playing to finish out the season affect your MVP vote? If you thought he was the MVP, and please tell us who you thought was your MVP as of Sunday afternoon when the football was over and done with. It really is a great question. And I, you know, just for context, like I, I just did my Pro Bowl snubs. You know, I, I was able to get the rosters a tad early. I guess that's one of the perks of working for the NFL. It's my first year there. So, uh, but yeah, Congrats. I mean, Isaac Sumalo made it. You know, I'm thinking of Eagles guys that I put on there. But it, you often had to sit there and say, well, they missed two games early in the year. Do, do, we, do we hold that against them, you know? Uh, He's hurt now. How does that affect the, you know, obviously players win awards without playing the full slate of games. It has happened. MVP might be held to a little bit of a different standard. And I don't know, this isn't quite 2017 Carson Wentz, but look, you know, I think there were people that prior to that, that end zone dive that he made against LA out there might've been on track to been some people's MVP, which is kind of crazy to think about now but still i mean that's it's amazing what one injury or one game can can do to change the narrative so <clears throat> i thought hurts had a really good chance i thought i thought part of it was maybe voter interest in maybe the someone new you know i don't i don't know if that's a, a fair factor to raise or not you guys can tell me what you think but it's always cool when you see a player go from intriguing to interesting to very very good right you know in a three-year span because it doesn't always happen that way and we've seen Jalen make those steps and he's in you know full command even with a couple picks in, on Sunday I thought he played well over I mean you know those are unforced errors but but he he responded in a big way with a, with a bad shoulder so it's the kind of performance that you say to yourself it's deserving of an MVP but is Patrick too good is is he gonna end up racking up 40 three or four touchdowns by the end of the year and, and over 5,000 yards. I think he's at 4,500 right now. So yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really tough, you know, missing one game can, can end up having a, a pretty big effect, especially for Jalen, who's, you know, doesn't quite have the passing heft. You know, I think there are seven or eight guys ahead of him in the passing yards. Again, should those things be the the biggest factor? Probably not, but to, to some voters, it may matter a lot. Yep. Well, at this point, at least they're seeing into our fishbowl, the fishbowl we've been looking at for the past year. Yep. So, I mean, at least they're taking notice, man. But, you know, just looking at the game and looking forward to Saturday and from an X and O standpoint, being an offensive lineman, I truly believe that we can run on that defense. And that's the, I think that'll be a major force in the game plan. I just think that, you know, they're going to pass a little more. But what do you think of being – this offensive line and how they're going to run against uh, the Dallas defense. Yeah. I forget who said it. Somebody on Twitter had a pretty good line about the Eagles offensive line. They're like, all right, it's week 10 or whatever it was at the time. I- I've stopped trying to look for a weakness in this group. And it's true. Right. <laughs> right. Right, you know right, I mean? right. There's really not a, a, a single individual player where you say, Ooh, I don't know. You can maybe exploit that. Now, when Jordan was hurt for that little stretch early in the season, I mean, that obviously changed things a little bit, but I agree. I mean, I think they, they absolutely can, can have that kind of effect and, and, you know, change their DNA a little bit. They're malleable enough where they, you know, we saw, for instance, against Chicago, I was watching the game. I don't think Miles had his first touch until it, you know, pretty well into the second quarter. So, right, right. right. If they need to go that route, if that's the game plan, if that's who you're facing, if that's just the way it turns out, fine. If you need to go the opposite direction and really kind of lean into the run game and the screen game and all that stuff, you can do it as well. So I think that's that's also another element to what makes them dangerous. And, you know, I would say Dallas defensively has been, you know, for the most part, so-so against the run, I would say. You know, they had that that little stretch, I want to say, against the – it was two playoff teams. It was the Vikings and Giants games where they looked pretty darn good. And, yeah, and you yeah, know, you said, yeah. wow, okay, maybe they, their run defense has really improved. And the last game against Jacksonville, I think they had like 180, 90 yards on the ground. So, you know, it gives you an indication that if they're not forcing turnovers on that side of the ball, they could have a little trouble stopping them. All right, Eric, unquestionably the NFC East 
has been the best division in football this year. And we're only two years removed from it being the NFC least when the, <laughs> uh, the, the football team made the playoffs below 500 as the divisional winner. So it's the, the pendulum swings pretty quickly in yep. the NFL. And the NFC East is where you have to have your eyeballs on Sunday. Certainly Eagles-Cowboys, the number one game. But the other two teams that right now are in the playoff hunt, the Commanders and the Giants, are both playing good games this week. Giants in Minnesota against the Vikings, who, yes, locked up their division, so it'll be interesting to see how they play, yep. but they want to keep it rolling toward the playoffs. And the 49ers and Commanders in San Francisco, so uh, nice little testers for the other teams in the NFC East. If you can only watch one of those two games, which, oh, by the way, you can watch both because one's at 1 o'clock and <laughs> one's right. at 4 o'clock. But if you had to make the choice, which one would you rather watch? Giants, pro- Vikings, Commanders, 49ers. Yeah, I would probably say <laughs> I would probably say Washington at San Fran. I think that's the game that I actually think I may have that game to, to write about for okay. the for NFL.com. I could be wrong, but um, – yeah, it's uh, to me. I mean, first of all, the 49ers are fascinating. You know, I mean, you guys are having the discussion about what it might be like without Jalen for a game or two, if that's the case. And and they're obviously on their third quarterback now. And you know, it's it's completely changed the the scenario. Yet they're still rolling up offensively. And and like you said, Washington is in that spot that they've kind of put themselves in, even by winning. You know, six out of seven or whatever it was, and then you know, tying and losing to the Giants has all of a sudden kind of derailed them and questioned whether Heineke's the guy. There's just maybe a little bit, uh, you know, more elements up in the air. We men- mentioned Carson Wentz earlier. He could still factor into this playoff race. I mean, that's that's reality because I don't know that we've seen enough out of Heineke, at least from Ron Rivera's voice and judging his words, to feel comfortable about that. But credit the Giants. They look like they were kind of sliding off the cliff, but – they, they dug a few fingernails in there, and they're still they're still hanging on. All right, but I got to ask you this one because I know you watched it. How badly were the commanders stiffed by the referees at the end of that game on Sunday night? First, the illegal guy wasn't on the line penalty, yeah. which he kind of checked with the ref to see if he was okay, and the ref said nothing. Then he throws the flag. Right. And then the final play, pretty obvious pass interference that they decided to let him play yeah how do you prep if you're washington this week just putting that behind you because i'd be pretty ticked off if i was still a commander player yeah i I know ron rivera a little bit and i suspect i don't know but i suspect his message was something to the effect of look we guys we can't control the refs we can only control ourselves were the refs bad in the last five minutes of that game and maybe further than that absolutely were the Giants bad in the last five minutes? I, you know, I thought so. They made mistakes as well. But Washington can look themselves in the mirror and say, we didn't execute. We didn't finish this game off. We let them build a, what, a 10 nothing lead or whatever, what, two-score lead, I know. So, you know, I would guess that Ron's message is, we cannot put the game in a position where the refs potentially could take it away from us or decide the, the outcome. And, you know, I mean, it's been a minute since they beat a quality – team that I well I guess the Eagles would be the last one although yeah. that was a lot closer than a two score game but you know it until the final moments or whatever but yeah they have to make sure that they put themselves in a position where no one or two bad calls can can tilt the game back to the opponent I know that's a little bit of coach speak and a little bit but seriously if that's that's what it takes then uh, to get to coax the their best out of them that's what they got to do at this point, who would you say is the biggest threat to the Eagles in the NFC? I mean, I mentioned San Francisco earlier. I realize Brock Pur- Pur- Purdy is the quarterback, but that defense is no joke. I mean, I think they're really, really good on that side of the ball. And, <clears throat> you know, it sort of feels like we're in a league now where there are a lot of decent to, you know, above average quality, good defenses, but not very many great ones. And I think I'd have to put them, you know, pretty much ever since Kansas City shellacked them, They've been lights out, especially in the second half. And, <clears throat> you know, that that matters. I mean, if you get into a low-scoring game and, and, you know, one turnover, one one poor series can really tilt the game. I, I don't dismiss Minnesota like some people do, but obviously their defense is a problem right now. Tampa Bay, I don't know what to make of them. I might put Dallas second on that list. So the Eagles have a pretty good – I mean, I wouldn't say the freeway is clear, but there are three or four lanes to choose from and <laughs> only a few cars to, to try to avoid. 
Well, in, in saying that, then, how would you compare the Eagles' defense to – because right now we're number two and the 49ers are number one. Right. We can stop the run now with the addition of Sue and and and, um, and Joseph. Yeah. I mean, what would you put us at right now as, as compared to them? I think it's got to – yeah, it's probably – top five right and and you know obviously cj's come in and been great without a whole lot of prep time and and you know you've seen slay in the corners do their job and and it's you know you don't have that middle of the field problem that was seemed like for years eagles were looking for quality linebackers i mean they, they've gotten good quality play out of i think every unit this year so yeah i mean if you think about like actual weaknesses on this defense i can't think of one right now because their sack rate is incredible they could have four you know double digit sack performers um uh, like the the inner you know the turnover rate is exceptional i would have to say that other than maybe a, a couple little holes in the run defense you know you might you could make the argument they're they're second or third right there okay all right um Jump over to the AFC for a second with me, if you would, yep. Eric. Uh, Eagles, Barrett and I are both way out there on the limb and suggesting the Eagles are going to win at least one of their last three games and have home field advantage throughout the yes. playoffs. AFC, much more so to be decided, <clears throat> still to be determined as to who's going to have home field advantage, uh, Chiefs and or uh, uh, Bills. I guess the uh, Bengals could still potentially sneak in there and get into the mix because they've got a big game left against Buffalo. How important is home field advantage in the AFC? Yeah, I think so. Probably maybe arguably more so in the NFC, but I don't know. I, I guess you could look at it two different ways. But, yeah, just having that advantage. And, you know, there have been obviously times when when teams have gotten that extra week of rest and, and they've come out a little slow against a team that maybe has you know, had to claw their way into the playoffs or – to win a division or whatever it may be. Sometimes that works for the team in the sense that the one that's resting is a little out of source. They haven't had those, those live, you know, uh, two, two for two last year, Tennessee right. lost green Bay lost the two there teams had to buy both got beat at home the week after. I remember writing that earlier this season and looking back and it happened far more than I realized, you know? So uh, obviously getting late season rest, every player's dream, right? Barrett, <laughs> like, you know, how nice is that? But uh, at the same time, it, it can also it depend on, I think, what the rest of the race is like, how many, you know, teams are, are having to kind of scratch their way in. But, you know, the AFC, I don't know that it's set, but like right now you've got to make a case for me to, for New England or, or the Jets to be playoff bound because, you know, neither has really looked it and they've got to, you know, get some work done to get in there. So I think Miami's dangerous in the AFC, even with their little recent skid. I don't trust the Chargers yet, even though I, I'd love to see Justin Herbert. <laughs> Nobody well. trusts the Chargers yet. I, you can't. <laughs> You're like, yeah, you just, bro, lend, lend me some money. Absolutely not. No way, dude. No, I've seen this before. You know, so Baltimore, they've fallen off. I don't know what to make of them. Tennessee. So really, I think it comes down to Buffalo, Kansas City, Bengals, obviously. And then I would argue Miami would be that that fourth team so maybe just a little deeper in terms of title contenders yeah i, I was thinking the same thing you know and, and just looking at it um then you look at the mvp race and of course you know we, we spoke on it before Jalen hurts not being but i want to say this on the and on, on the um afc side i mean who do you think is better is it is it you know patrick mahomes or do you think it's Allen? I mean, who's the guy yeah i mean it's really hard. I, I I think Patrick has been really good. I think I think Josh has been a little bit too up and down. He had that stretch in the middle of the year. You know, they lost the game to the Vikings where he threw the end zone pick, and they had about 16 chances to win that game, and they and they went 0 for 16 or whatever. So it, it really has been tough. But I would say that, you know, even with Mahomes having a I think he's got like 12 interceptions this year, a little higher than normal 11, 12, whatever the number is. So, you know, have the turnovers been a little bit more uh, frequent than we've seen in years past? Yes, but I would still make a case for him. I mean, for, yeah, Mahomes over Allen. I might even argue that Joe Burrow has is, is had a, at least lately, you know, after the 0-2 start, has had a, a stronger last 
eight or 10 games than Allen has overall. He's been banged up too. So Allen. So yeah, I mean, other than obviously, you know, Hertz and Justin Jefferson and a couple guys in the NFC, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go past those three quarterbacks in the AFC for even being in the discussion for, for the race. Eric, we've had you on the show before. More draft related than anything else, because we know how good you are in evaluating players. <laughs> Thank you. Forward toward the draft, uh, and you've done a great job analyzing the NFL for us today. But I do want to tap into your expertise. Just one quick question, and we're going to yeah. have you back out again when we get closer to the draft. We got the playoffs coming up. You got two quarterbacks that are going to go very high in the draft, playing in either bowl games and or the playoffs. I've been debating this back and forth with guys all year, and my take is they're very close. But if you had to put C.J. Stroud and Bryce Young in an order, what order would you have them? And what do you think the difference is between the two guys right now? Knowing that evaluation can still change with how they play in the ball games, with how they play uh, the combine, whatever else sure. factors into it. But right now, how do you have the two of them ranked and how big a difference is there between them? You know I'm going to throw you a curveball, Jody. You know I am. I'm going to do it. Okay, I give it to me. I'm always ready for a curve. I, so the last few weeks, I've, I've been trying to catch You're up. You're not going to tell me that there's someone else other than one of those two. We'll see. We'll see. You got to hang oh, in there. You're not. You, know? you and you and <laughs> stretching Kiper it out. Not. You know, Will Levis. Are you kidding me? Oh, Stop oh wait. It. Oh wait. Oh wait. Here's the. Well, first of all, Will Levis is far more appreciated and liked in the scouting community than he is on Twitter. I mean, I'm just saying like as a fact. <laughs> and I'm a Twitter guy. Wait. I, I watch games. You know I watch games. And I, I know I you do. Wait, same as you. Nobody Will watches Evans games like you do, man. Overrated. Oh my God, is he overrated? I, he's, he's he's a he's a ball of clay, and I mean, you gotta you have to mold him. And and he took in my mind, he played better last year than he did this season. Yeah, I didn't watch every throw or every game, but I watched enough to feel pretty good about that. Play tough kid. Played through an ankle injury. Played through oh, was it a shoulder? I'm trying to remember some kind of upper body injury as well. So. He was out there a little bit banged up. I can't excuse the fumbles and the interceptions and the poor decisions. There are some out there. It's the same kind of discussion. I'm not comparing them apples to apples, but same discussion we had with Josh Allen, just at a higher level, SEC versus, um, you know, the Mountain West. So obviously that that plays in Levis's favor. The other guy that I'll mention, Anthony Richardson from Florida, you have to, you know, you have to – look through some some poor reps as well with him you you can't just say wow that's a you know gorgeous thrower no i mean he's had plenty of throws where he's looked like he needs development but there are some people convinced that richardson might end up being the best quarterback of the entire lot they're is that because about, it hurts is that because it hurts and adam that's it that's a really good question i think i'm gonna write on that subject yeah where it's like you have these thickly built quality runners who have great arm strength and they have the mental toughness to to survive not only hits but also the demands put on a quarterback it's all there you just got to kind of fine tune it you guys remember watching Hurts at Alabama as a freshman did anybody think this was going to be an NFL quarterback I'm sorry maybe as a running back that's what I saw it was was built like a running back and as each year he kept stacking you said okay he's taking strides he's gotten better Levis is older too. That's the only thing. He's going to be 24, I think, at some point during his rookie year. So at least he's younger than Hendon Hooker. That's right. Or Hendon Man. Than Hendon Hooker, as a matter of fact. Watch him. I can't pull it off, but Barrett can. You can, Eric. I'm I'm turning 47 in a few days. I I don't I don't like to joke about the age as much anymore. So uh, at least the first number isn't six, big big guy. Yeah, (laughs) touche. Yeah, this is really going to be an interesting group. I I think all of them have at least sort of one Achilles heel, if you will. Bryce Young's going to measure in at 5'10", 190. He's not really a runner. You know, and he had to play through injuries, too. It's like, are you going to take that with the first pick of the draft? And I love the guy. I love watching him play. I, all I know is that Eagles draft pick, you know, you're, you're hoping for those guys to all play well during the pre-draft process. It makes it that right. much more valuable if you want to move down. Agreed. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. you did a great job analyzing for us. You didn't answer my question. Forget <laughs> Levin, forget Richardson, forget I everybody young. else. Young, I take young Stroud, what's the one-two young. order? And how much of a difference is there between the two? CJ's, a, I think, a good pocket passer and could work really well on a team like the the Rams. Like, to me, he's like 
Jared Goff. Like I think that's the kind of player he is. When 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 the structure is there, when when he's got quality receivers, a good offensive line, and you know his first read and his second read are open. Boy, all options are out there. I think he's, but it's. I don't think he's a creator. I just think he's he's got limitations. So I would take Young, who I think processes a little faster and seems to have a little bit more off script playmaking ability. Yeah, I get yeah. it too. I get that, that too. That's yeah. funny. I I would like to compare Stroud to a Rams quarterback, not a former one, the current one. I think he's going to be more Stafford like. Stafford. I think he's got a, a he's got really the arm. solid arm and yeah. he's going to be able to put up numbers in the league. Uh, you put up great numbers for us today, Eric. Thank you much for hopping on. Appreciate you it, know, I'm going to be reaching back to you again to get you on uh, toward the playoffs and then certainly leading up to the draft this year. Thanks much. Have a happy holiday, my friend. Yes, you guys as well. Appreciate and all you, listeners. Man. Have a great uh, Christmas holiday, whatever you celebrate. Thank who's, you, guys. Who's Missouri playing in the bowl this year? You uh, Wake should... Forest. We've got uh, hoops tonight, football uh, tomorrow. So, or, yeah, I guess I got that right. So, <laughs> oh, and two, baby. Let's go. You got it. All right. Eric, who's finest? <laughs> Eric get off from uh, NFL.com. We should have him on as a Yahoo guy. He uh, moved his uh, tact and computer. His. Uh, personal computer over to the nfl.com did a great job uh promoing uh previewing eagles cowboys and the entire week 16 in the nfl barrett and i don't need to get on the record just yet because he'll be on later today and again tomorrow before the game but i got one more eagle question to give 